three whistleblowers are going to be splitting $1.7 million in a reward for bringing the defective airbags, the, the story behind the defective airbags that were made uh, by Takata, bringing that to the attention of the regulators. The truth behind this story is the regulators had plenty of information to begin with, and they did what all regulators in America do today. They did nothing. Takata, the regulators that were looking at the Takata airbag absolutely knew how dangerous it was. They understood that the airbag would explode. It would send shrapnel into the heads and the bodies of people that were, that, that were caught in the middle of that. I mean, the, it, it blows up, but it doesn't just blow up and cause a problem that's a minor problem. It burns the individuals. It throws shrapnel into their eyes, into their head. Uh, deaths, deaths related to this. Okay, look, here's the point. Whistleblowers that worked for the company came in and said they knew about it. Pick up. Well, <laughs> the, the three whistleblowers in this particular case, you know, they, they had been working with the regulators, but I, this, as you pointed out, was after the regulators were pretty aware of what was happening with Takata, didn't want to do much of anything about it. Takata is one of the biggest airbag producers in the world, not just in the United States, in the world. So they kind of sat on the issue, but now that these whistleblowers you know, had come forward with this information showing Takata knew about it. They covered it up. They did not fix the problem. They built it into the cost of doing business. We know X amount of people are going to die. We're going to pay settlements for it, but that's going to be cheaper than recalling, you know, 30, 40 million vehicles because we've essentially placed IEDs in their steering wheel instead, instead of airbags. And, and so these whistleblowers, had they not come forward with this, what we would have seen was the regulators dragging their feet on it a little bit longer, a few more deaths. I think right now it's at 22 uh, people have died, countless yeah, injuries. Injuries, loss this. of eyes. Uh, yeah. lo yes. Well, look, here's the point. Here, here's what's really creepy about this story. There are 59 million airbag inflators out there, 59 million of all different vehicles. At this point, there's only been 21 million that have been recalled and fixed. So you've got all of these airbags still out there being sold, used cars. People don't have any idea. You know, a person goes, buys a, a car that's a few years old. They don't think about, well, gee, did I check out the Takata airbag? And then the, the, the downside of that is the recall doesn't really get through to them. So they're driving around, as you point out, with, a, with, with an IED in their car. He, What's bothersome a little bit, well, very bothersome to me, is you had these, they collected a billion dollars in a settlement, okay? Now follow this. They collect a billion dollars. The people who actually gave them the material and, and gave, just, here it is, government, finally do your job, you know? Department of Justice, actually do something instead of just talking a game. Go out and do something, which the Department of Justice is deplorable about. They, they rarely do their job where it goes, where it comes to going after white collar criminals. So here they find, really, they find the Takata folks for a billion dollars. And at this point, nobody's gone to prison, have they? No, absolutely not. And they never will. Yeah. I mean, even if Takata intentionally well, they made, did. Their, made their airbags to do this, well, you know, nobody would still go to jail because that's how it is. And the, the, these fines of a billion dollars, two billion dollars, 500 million, it doesn't matter what it is because they've got that money sitting in the bank ready to be paid off in fines because they've made four or five times that in profit. And it, it, it is what they call the cost of doing okay. business. How about this though? Takata knows, here's what they've done. This is what the documents show. They concealed reports that they knew about the bag would explode and kill people. They concealed reports where they knew that. They subverted testing procedures where people within the company were saying, you need to do more testing because what, what we're looking at now looks really bad. And they falsified data. When the tests were done, they would make up, phony up data to make it look like there wasn't a problem. Now, understand, they killed people. They, th this, is, this, is no, this is manslaughter here. This is the equivalent of somebody drinking a fifth of, of, of whiskey and driving 100 miles an hour through a school through, through a school zone. This is manslaughter. The DOJ does not have the guts. They don't have the backbone to say these people are murderers. Why don't, why don't we prosecute somebody? Why don't we throw somebody in jail? 
it's much easier just to take the billion dollars and business goes on as usual. Yeah, because you know that that's money, and, and we've done stories about this in the past. That's money that they then get to use for their offices. <laughs> to an extent, they do keep a portion of yeah, it, for themselves. and they work that into their budget now. Now my agency has more money yeah. to go and play with, right. whereas you don't get that when you throw somebody in prison. We got, yeah, I've got about two minutes. Look, former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens was back in the headlines this past week after he called for a repeal of the Second Amendment, a move that has conservatives freaking out. I mean, the gun stores must be going crazy right now. Look, this is, I think is a bad move by Stevens. Absolutely. I think you, you would agree. Explain, I think we probably agree on, what, what is your take on what Stevens did here? Well, you know, fo following the, the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, we finally had a national discussion because of the, the kids there that got active and made this discussion happen. But we finally get the discussion. We're getting a little bit of legislation here and there in Florida, in other states, that's starting to work on it. You know, it's not going to fix it, but we're getting a little bit better gun control. We're, uh, bump stocks might get banned. But then you have John Paul Stevens, a Republican justice, by the way, mm. who says, you know what, let's just ban the Second Amendment and, and just get rid of it all. And that just set back this conversation okay, look, and the fa progress. Fair enough. Explain how difficult it is to change anything constitutional. <laughs> I mean, people don't get this. What is it? You have to have two thirds. You got to have two, two, two thirds of both the House and, and the, the Senate. Senate. To, and, to do anything constitutional. And then it's got to get past... Uh, um, three, was it three quarters? Three, three quarters of the state legislature, which would be 38 states. I mean, we're talking about virtually... No. Well, here's the real... This case can be won. It has to be won under, under the police powers. You have to take item by item and say, we're taking away the bump stock because the Second Amendment, first of all, if you assume it, it is real, that people are supposed to have guns, even if it is police powers, health, safety, and welfare give us a superior position in the argument. We're going to trump the Second Amendment because we believe that health, safety, and welfare of our people here in Florida using a bump, uh, using a bump stock, that those people are at a greater risk. So this could be one, but it, it, to, to su suggest that we're going to win it by a constitutional amendment, Stevens knew exactly how way out there that and, was. It can be won. And, and it fires up the other side way too much oh, yeah. when we finally made progress. They're crazy now. The, the gun stores are jam-packed.